OK, welcome, everybody. Today we will be looking at IMDb and uh, three topics like the relational model and entity relationship modeling. So it's a little um, reminder that's the planned structure we have for every two-week block. Uh, this is already an exception, so this may be a little bit longer. Um, so we will be looking first at a concrete application. That's IMDb. I think most of you know that already. Um, we will look at that web page, uh, what it does and what the problems are. So in particular, in the, the, second, the second question here is what are the data management and analysis issues behind such a web page? Then we will look at uh, the basics to be able to solve those problems, those data management problems in terms of slides and also Jupyter notebooks. And then finally, we transfer those basics to this concrete application. So. Uh, the concrete, concrete application we will be looking at is IMDb, and that's an internet movie database available at this, this link. And it basically keeps data on film and television productions. It has been started in 1990. Um, and as of March, I just looked it up again, it's about 14 million titles available on that page. So if you go to that page, you will see, um, yeah, um, basically, have a search bar here. We can, I don't know, ask for particular movies. Let's ask for The Fifth Element, for instance. I hope you saw that movie. It's an awesome movie from the 90s, but still awesome. And then um, you get all kinds of information about that movie, like who is the director. Maybe I switch to English here. Um, English, United States, maybe. Boop. Yeah, so who's the director? Who are the writers? Um, and so forth, and so forth. And um, yeah, so you can basically um, navigate around that movie. Um, so if I click here, you get a couple of pictures about that movie, like posters that were used to advertise the movie. Uh, you can navigate, like for instance, uh, to the director, so Luc Besson, and then you also see other movies um, he directed. Um, writers he was involved with, uh, producers he worked with, and stuff like that. So it's all kinds of little information snippets that are provided on the web page. And of course, those web pages are not static web page in the sense that they sit as a file on that web server. Yeah, it's not that, that, it's a, that this is a predefined static file. So what this web server in the background is doing is it's merging uh, web templates, HTML templates with those data snippets somehow. It's called a template engine. So there is some system on that web page that uh, contains all of that data and parts of the data are merged with a, a web template and then that uh, final HTML site that's being delivered is served, is sent to my web browser. Yeah? And you also see that when, so basically whenever you have a search query here, whenever you navigate to any page, there's a dynamic pro process on the server going on, merging these two, two things. Yeah? If you look for whatever, Star Wars, um, I don't know. Yeah, same thing, you can, um, I don't know, here. Look at more detailed information than you, uh, all kinds of people involved in those movies. Yeah, the cast uh, in that movie, yeah, then you can of course navigate to any of those actors and so forth and so forth. So many, many tiny information snippets that are somehow served from the web page. So um, what, what makes the difference here in this web page to uh, other systems, say, um, yeah, we talked about this uh, in famous uh, student management system on campus. This is mostly read only. This is read mostly. You don't have a chance to cha change the data here, unless you direct the movie yourself or, or you become an actor uh, in a movie, but still then you won't uh, change that web page yourself. Yeah? Your name will appear eventually on that web page. So basically what I'm trying to say is this is read only. Yeah? We won't be tackling insert, update, delete stuff. That's another story. Uh, we will be spending two weeks with that. So for the moment it's read only. And the only question we have is, okay, how, how do we organize this kind of information uh, such that we can efficiently model it and map it. So, um, so I uh, added some screenshots to the slides, but the same stuff I just um, showed you. So the questions we will be looking at are, are those two here. So how is the data on films, actors, directors modeled and stored in IMDb? And in particular, how, how are links between these data items modeled 
and stored in IMDb. So how do I keep that information that this actor participated in a, a played in a specific movie? Yeah? And this director um, directed this specific movie. So those are links between data items I have to represent. And then um, next week we will be looking at, okay, how do we query this data? Once we modeled it in this particular way, how do we query this stuff? So um, we will be looking at two techniques. One is entity relationship models and the other is uh, the relationship, um, the relational model. Those techniques are old but gold. Huh? Invented in the 70s, but they're still state of the art, the way to go. There, there, have, there have been so many other proposals, improvements have been made more details, more fancy stuff. For instance, um, in the space of modeling, you may have learned about um, UML. In software engineering, that's very popular. But UML has no benefit whatsoever over entity relationship models, in, in, in the database world at least. Yeah? So I highly recommend for any practical problem dealing with data, start with this one. So what is, what is that stuff? So this is just... Um, so on every slide set, slide set, we keep the learning objectives just for you to go back to understand, okay, the slide set contains those concepts so we don't have to go through that. Um, so how I will, ex uh, will be explaining this stuff is as follows. So um, when you try to download this data, that the IMDB data is actually publicly available and you can go to the, I don't know, some, uh, I have the link somewhere on the slides as well. Uh, where's that? I think somewhere you can get the data, maybe very down below jobs, get the MDB app, the full site, how many pro, maybe developer, maybe it's here somewhere. I have the link somewhere on the slides. So you can download this even an API. So you can download this stuff. Um, we didn't download it from IMDB itself, but we used a snapshot someone created <clears throat> that's uh, better for teaching um, as we believe. And when you go uh, to this website, yeah, you will get uh, information on how the data is stru structured. So how is this schema, as we call it, of the data? How are data items related? Yeah? And what, we, what you see is something like that. And uh, this is interesting information, let's phrase it like that, but that is not how we will be modeling data in this lecture. Huh? So we will now, in the following, reverse engineer this to become a proper entity relationship model. And, and on the way, I will explain to you what entity relationship modeling is anyways. Huh? So that is the start. Um, so it's, what you see is here we have seven tables, yeah? just uh, trying to understand what's going on. We have seven tables, one, two, three, and so forth. So each of those tables have a name. Then there are these, uh, this portion uh, of the visual visualization is always a key value kind of um, entry. So that's an attribute name. And then that's the type of that attribute. So there's an attribute uh, named ID and it has a type integer. Attribute named first name, it has a type varchar. Var varchar is basically a, a string uh, if, if you want. Um, so maybe I have to scale it down. And um, then there are these arrows um, that um, si uh, symbolize something like, okay, somehow this table is linked to this table. So they don't specify in this visualization how exactly um, that works, but what, what, what they mean is if you look, for instance, for instance at uh, director genres, mapping to directors, so director genre, mapping to directors, what is meant is that this attribute, director's ID, underscore ID of director genres, references director's dot ID. Yeah? So director, uh, where is it, director genres, this one references this one somehow. It's not directly set in that visualization, but that is what is meant. Yeah? Okay, so... Um, yeah, that's the database. So if you go, again, yeah, that's the link I mentioned. So if you want to download it directly from IDB, that's what you can do. You can play with that freely. It's all fine. The only thing you really mustn't do, and they will get pretty unhappy if you do that, provide an IMDB-style service yourself. Yeah, if you get the idea, oh, I download the data, and then I do my own IMDB and put it online, you will have trouble. Don't do that. Yeah? So it's fine for educational purposes, for playing with data analytics, that's fine but don't uh, do your own IMDb++. Okay, so that is the semantics of those tables you find on that snapshot. So, um, 
the main thing to understand is, okay, directors in German, Regisseure, movies, Filme, actors, Schauspieler. And then there's information about so, uh, certain genres, genre being action, a romance, uh, fantasy, and stuff like that. Yeah? So we have it like multiple times here. And there are roles. Yeah? So an actor appeared in a movie in a specific role. Typically, actors don't play themselves. There are notable exceptions to that, but typically they have a certain role and a, and a specific name for that role. So um, now let's convert this, what you find on that web page, to a proper entity relationship model. And I will be um, replacing those visual elements um, in that initial graphic one by one. Again, this is not a correct diagram as you should be using it uh, later on in this lecture. So the first thing uh, we do is uh, we introduce so-called entity types. What is an entity type? And from the beginning, we really try to say entity type, not entity. When you, when you uh, Google for this stuff on the web, you will uh, see people using it as entity, uh, some say entity type, but it's really two different thing, things. It's like an object-oriented modeling. It's like a class and an object, a class and an instance, or in C++, a st struct and a record instance you create from that. It's really important. So what I'm talking about is a type definition, an abstraction with no real data uh, behind that for the moment. Huh? So that de describes a class of entities that semantically represents the same concept. For instance, yeah, directors, yeah, they belong to the same class. They have the same function, so to say, in, in that data model. Yeah, so I put them in one box. Yeah, the same holds for actors, the same holds for movies, and can somehow put them together uh, to facilitate data modeling. And the notation is super simple. It's just a rectangle. The color doesn't really matter. I use orange for those entity types, but you can use whatever you want. Yeah, so uh, in more textual form, an entity type, capital EI, describes and models a set of entities. Each entity type has a unique name, preferably in plural. That's important. So we don't say director, we say directors. You will also see on the web some people use singular. I really want to have it in plural because it makes more sense. Because when you have such a box, yeah, <clears throat> you have a box of... Um, Let's go to this mode where we, um, yeah, you have a box. Oh man, let's make it smaller. Um, boom. Yeah, if you have such a box, <clears throat> directors, yeah, I write it outside now. That's a box. <clears throat> so that's the entity type. And what are the entities? The entities are like you can say little elements here. Yeah, oops. Uh, here, there's Kenton, there's make it a dot or make it a bubble, whatever you want. Yeah, this, those are the entities in those box. And maybe that's entity, that entity there's uh, Quentin Tarantino, that's Steven Spielberg, and that's, uh, I don't know, <laughs> Alfred Hitchcock, yeah? comes to mind. Yeah? So all these different directors I will be putting into this box. Okay. Um, yeah, that's the analogy I mentioned already. Huh? Class versus object, entity type versus entity. And we will, um, what's important in the, in the following, we'll also see, um, we will be connecting certain elements in our diagrams and those data models, but you can never ever uh, connect one entity type to another entity type. Yeah? So if you have a director, you can't directly um, connect it two movies. You will see that in the moment why that is the case and how to fix that. So uh, we have entity types, those boxes. Now we need attributes because we model, we want to model meaningful information about um, those entities. So for instance, for a director, we want to have, hey, that's the first name of the director, that's the last name. Uh, same for actors, first name, last name, and so forth. Movies have a name, a year when they were produced or appeared, unclear. There's just the year information for the moment. You could have a rank information that's used for ranking results in an IMDb. It doesn't matter for the moment. So we have these ellipses that uh, rep represent um, attributes. The color doesn't matter again. And what you also see here is there's no domain, there's no type information. 
So I don't write a first name um, colon string or something like that, or ID colon integer. I don't write that because it's in the way. It's not important for the moment. The question we are trying to solve at this point in time is just, okay, what kind of information principle should be modeled for those specific entity types? And for that, I don't need a, a, type, um, in a, a domain information huh? or a type like integer or string. That comes later. Okay, so now we have attributes. Um, again, a little bit more. Uh, so I always have these uh, slides in between that are a bit more formal. I will jump over some of those slides and you can read back, uh, back home, you can read about those slides. So this one is really easy. So an attribute aspect describes an aspect of an entity type or relationship type. We didn't have that. We will come to that in a moment, but I showed you entity types already. So an aspect of an entity type it belongs to exactly one entity type. For an entity type, capital E, I, its attributes are named meaningfully. So either th through some letters with a capital A or with a real name, like first name, last name, or something like that. Yeah? Something that is easily understood, that's not ambiguous, that you can look at and you see, the, yeah, yeah, that's what meant, what's meant. Yeah? I try to use meaningful attribute names makes your life so much easier. Okay, so um, yeah, a short notice about domains. So um, domain is the term we use in databases to mean a value range or a type. Yeah, if like in mathematics, uh, the math professor says, okay, that's the real numbers or those are rational numbers. Yeah, for us, that's a domain. Yeah? Or integer, string, whatever, Boolean, that's a domain. Yeah? So that's for us a set of atomic values. Uh, my real numbers are not, yeah, okay, <laughs> different story yeah? in the computer there. Uh, so it's a set of the, uh, atomic values. These values mustn't be structured. Uh, um, so they, they, they should not, uh, you should not be able to further devise those numbers. Um, domains are notated with a capital D, uh, yeah, like integer, float, string, and so, way, and so forth. And as I said, the domain is not specified. Um, yeah, and then we have attribute values. So an attribute value is a concrete instance of the attributes domain. Yeah, so here's an example. If you have an entity type lecture, and it has an attribute duration, a concrete attribute value, maybe 90 minutes or just 90, yeah? if you leave away the minutes and if, if, if that's clear anyway. So that is the attribute value. Okay, so we have entity types. Now we get to relationship types. So relationship types express that two entity types are connected to each other. So in this example, the idea is that directors make movies. And you may already uh, notice that, well, that can be um, fuzzy because, I mean, you could, why not read it like that? Movies make directors. Yeah? Sometimes it's a bit unclear when you read it, uh, such an entity relationship diagram, what is meant. Yeah? What are, um, I mean, here it's the other way around. Actors play in movies rather than movies play in actors. So typically the convention is that you should arrange the diagram such that you can read it from left to right and from top to bottom. And then it should be semantically meaningful, but that's not always possible. Sometimes it's not clear and uh, yeah, then you have to think about it a little bit. Or you can additionally um, annotate those relationships types actually um, by, by writing something like, uh, something like is made here, or makes, or is, or is maker, yeah, you could say something like that. I mean, let's write it in this way here with this one. It's better. Uh, uh, you could write, ah, this is, well, no, it's okay. So I'm zooming in too much. Uh, let's do it like that. Yeah, you could annotate, if there's an ambiguity, you could say, okay, is made, or and makes. Yeah, so to say, okay, this is clear, the director makes a movie, not the movie makes uh, the director and stuff like that. Yeah. So this is, those uh, annotations are called roles. Yeah. You sometimes see those in um, uh, those diagrams. Okay, um, 
Yeah, notation is a diamond. Again, colors do not matter. Um, reading direction I mentioned, and here's another example. Directors make movies. That's basically what I show and actors play in movies. So, come on. So basically, relations, these relationship types describes a set of relationships. Each relationship type in a di ER diagram has a unique name. Again, plural if possible. And uh, important, such a relationship type can be associated with any number uh, n of entity types, but never directly with other relationship types. Um, actually, how you, you could also um, make that uh, one if you wanted, then the, the relationship type would be connected to the same entity type multiple times yeah, in different roles. I think we will be looking at that in the context of the exercises. But to simplify that for the moment, let's assume it's always two entity types you're connected with. And it can be more than two in particular. And then things get a bit, little bit more difficult. So if it's uh, two entity types uh, you're connected with, it's called binary. If it's three, it's ternary. And if it's more than that, you say it's an n-ary relationship type. What's important, a relationship type can also have its own attributes. Yeah? Not only entity types may have attributes, but also relationship types. So here are a couple of examples. So um, if you have a relationship type make, in the example above, that's binary. Yeah, if you go back, yeah, that's binary because there's one, two entity types. Yeah? Play in is the same, it's binary. and. Uh, Here's an example for an attribute. So here's an attribute of such a relationship type, of a binary relationship type. Okay, so that's, that's a lot of notation for the moment. Okay, so here we are basically. So we have our entity types, we have our relationship types, we have attributes all over the place. And now what we need in addition are keys, Schlüssel in German. And um, the keys, keys are just some of the attributes, a subset of those attributes that allow us, allow us to uniquely identify the entity types entities. Yeah? You see, we, I will be using these terms to really make the difference between entity types and entities. It's super important. Yeah? So the entity types contains entities. And I want to make sure that by only specifying the key attributes, I can uniquely identify that entity. Yeah, did you get? Yeah, yeah, let's think about that. I want to identify entities and an entity type, and I better do that by just specifying a subset of the attributes, namely the key attributes. So if you, you, you will often see in these um, schemas, there's an attribute called ID. Yeah, ID is an artificial attribute you assign to each and every entity in the entity type. Yeah? And we make sure that all IDs of those entities are pairwise different, are unique. Yeah? And then if you say, okay, I want to have the director uh, that has the ID um, uh, 42, that then there can only be at most one entity having that ID. Yeah? That's the idea of a key. Uh, so um, you don't have to use these official attrib uh, artificial attributes you can also use any other attributes. But for instance, a uh, standard example, if you, you, you could say, okay, first name and last name are my attributes. Oh, that's okay, let's do it like that. And let's make it more interactive at that point. Uh, so if I say this is not my key, so this is not underlined anymore, this is my key together with the last name. That's a valid way of specifying a key. I would say, okay, if I specify first name and last name, that is a key of entity type actors. So what's the problem with that? Yeah. Yeah, same. If, if two people have the same name, over. You can't model that anymore. So that's typically a very bad idea. Then you say, okay, um, I had that actually in our library where I live in uh, uh, St. Ingbert. They said, no, no, you also have to specify uh, um, your birthday. Yeah, bur uh, day of birth, or what's in English? Birth of birthday, yeah, birthday. Yeah, that's uh, the Sank Ingbert way of doing a key. So what's the problem with that? <laughs> yeah, two people having the same name, 
uh, being born on the same, uh, having the same birth date doesn't work. So it's kind of a probabilistic way of modeling, saying, yeah, yeah, it's super unlikely. Come on, it's not going to happen. Things will happen. Murphy's law. If it can, yeah, it's going to happen. So this just don't work. So typically, if you do something like that, you really have to, you typically end up using these uh, artificial, um, artificial ideas yeah, because they fix everything, basically. Okay. Um, yeah, that's what I wanted to say about that one. So again, here's the definition. So keys, that's a subset of the attributes of an entity type. Yeah, that's it. Subset of the attributes of an entity type can be all of the attributes. It doesn't have to be a proper subset, can be all of the attributes. Um, and those are called the key attributes that uniquely identify each entity of the entity type by these attributes. The subset is marked by underlining. What's important here is that we want to have minimality of those keys. So if we, uh, if we pick a subset and we can, we can reduce the subset and still conceptually identify all entities with it, then the current subset doesn't form a key. Uh, we have to reduce it. If you pick too many attributes to be the key, not good. Example, uh, if you set in this example, uh, my key is first name and ID. So both are underlined. That's too big because ID alone could identify those records. You don't have to add another first name and last name. That doesn't make any sense. Yet. You just want to make it minimal. That's very important. Huh? And uh, on the other, uh, the, uh, the opposite direction is if the subset of the attributes cannot, cannot conceptually distring, distinguish all entities, then the subset of attributes also forms no key. Yeah? So we have to enlarge it or you have to replace it. So an example was um, yeah, first name, last name, yeah? or, or just pick name, oops, just pick name. Yeah? If that is your key attributes without the ID, no, you have to enlarge it somehow, or you even have to replace it by using some other um, attribute. Yeah, and then there's another twist that's very important um, in, for real data. Now assume you have, a, you have concrete data. Assume you have um, already a collection, a list of directors you want to model, you want to, um, yeah, for your IMDb scenario. You have a list of directors, and you find out that there is no duplicate with respect to first name and last name. So why would I use an ID? I mean, I can use first name in combination with last name, right? Yeah, that's right. So our data, he's saying the data set isn't static. So uh, maybe some other answer to that, some other ideas. I, mean, I could use first name and last name as a, as a key. Uh, yeah? Yeah, I could even go into that direction. I could argue, okay, maybe I can check my data whether first name is already unique for my data or last name is already unique and then say, okay, that is the key I will be using. Okay, does anyone see an issue with that? Yeah? Maybe it is unique now, but not in the future. Exactly, very good, excellent answer. Maybe it is unique now, but not in the future. So what we do in data modeling is not model the data we are seeing right now, but we are trying to model the data conceptually, having in mind that future changes may break everything. So based on how we model the data here, we will make decisions, we, we will uh, create systems, we will do stuff uh, that, that will lead to implementations. And now you try to insert another Quentin Tarantino. Uh, the second, I don't know, there's only one, of course, but there may, eventually there might be a second uh, Quentin Tarantino. Boom. Yeah, so you don't want to do that. You want to have a data model that is uh, yeah, kind of future-proof or yeah, that, that is ready to accept those uh, duplicates. It may only appear in the future. Yeah? Therefore, it's really important um, to pick the right keys here. Yeah, so that's, I think, it's, pff, I'll read about it. <laughs> yeah, we always try, try. We did that in like two, two or three years ago. There was someone complaining, hey, I also want to have formal definitions. Wouldn't that be cool? Yeah, and then we did that. But it's just in a little bit more mass notation what I just explained to you. You can read that back home if you want, yeah? if you like this stuff. But for the flow of the lecture, I believe it's in the way. Okay. 
So uh, this is important, however. So the interplay of relationship types and entity types. So now suppose we're in a situation like this. So we have this um, relationship type. We have a couple of entity types, n, namely, the relationship type has a couple of attributes, roots its own attributes. And now what we can do is um, we interpret those entity types as domains. Uh, these capital E1 to EN are interpreted as domains with entities small e i element capital E i. Then we can write B as an N plus K B array tuple. So basically now this tuple looks as follows. We have these small e's corresponding to those entity types. Then we have the attribute values um, corresponding to the attributes of B. And that is um, an element of this Cartesian product. Yeah? So E, a capital E, cross, and so forth, and so forth, ca uh, cross capital E N. And then uh, come, come the domains from uh, the attribute values of B. So basically, it's just a tuple. Yeah? This, this relation, a relationship uh, in that relationship type. In other words, an element sitting here can be interpreted as a tuple yeah? in that, uh, like, like described here um, above. So that's one way of, uh, of seeing those relationships and relationship types. And if you try to write that, that down for a concrete example, it would look as follows. So assume we have this n array, n being four, um, relationship type, and we have uh, five of those relationships, namely five of those tuples that are contained here in that uh, diamond. So I wrote them down here. So five of those, this is just here for convenience, just uh, making, uh, just telling you, okay, uh, which of those relationships uh, I'm, uh, I mean. Yeah, then I have those five domains in this example. Yeah? One domain for each participating entity type plus this domain for this attribute uh, of that re um, relationship type. Yeah? And then you can write it like that. Yes, yeah? so you have this small e. Yeah? The one is signaling it belongs to this uh, uh, capital E1 and then a number making sure that they're all different. Yeah? So that is what this definition above actually means. Yeah? That, uh, here you have the small e, and all of, the, all of this is a tuple uh, representing that relationship. And that is, of course, basically unreadable if you handle this data. Yeah? Could you maybe uh, give a concrete example for an attribute of relationship? Mm -hmm. I can't really imagine. Yeah, like role. We will get to that in a moment. Um, here we have that, right? So movie. Movies and actors. An actor, uh, simply we'll get to that in a moment. Assume an actor uh, uh, has multiple roles in a movie. Yeah, if you have to represent the actor multiple times. If you don't do that, you have a problem. You will get to that because all of these things are uh, represented as sets eventually. Yeah, then it wouldn't work. Yeah? So it's really important that you be, that you be able to um, uh, actors having different roles in a movie. Or assume uh, something like... Um, well, what else could you do? Um, and maybe here next, maybe we can do another example here. If you did something like, um, uh, what comes to my mind? Uh, people have. Um, Okay, uh, that should actually be a ternary relationship. Let's uh, increase it into a binary, whatever. Have an account at, have account at bank. Yeah, representing accounts people have at a specific bank. Yeah, so what if someone has multiple accounts at the same bank? Yeah, then you would have to add an attribute here with a, whatever the account number or something like that. Yeah? Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Why is bank a relationship type? Uh, because it's wrong, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very good, yeah. I did it intentionally to test whether you were right. <laughs> there was another mistake I did. I wrote bank 
It should be banks, plural. Yeah, always a plural. Yeah? That's right. Yeah? So something like that. Then you would say account number, account number. And what you will, what you will actually see later on, um, it's very often like that. If you have a binary relationship uh, like this, and there's a, an attribute here, like here, what, what typically, and I, I, I wanted to do it like that, just, just I didn't want to confuse you uh, uh, initially. What you will do is, you will have, you just write have, and then you write accounts. That would be a way more natural way of modeling that. So three entity types, somehow in a relationship, um, and this somehow is represented by that relationship type. Yeah, we will get to that. Yeah, I, I know it's confusing if you first see these ternary uh, relationship types. We will get there. Yeah? But uh, there's it's typically, uh, when you see attributes of relationship types, you can typically switch this stuff easily uh, to make it an entity type. Yeah? We will get there. OK, any other questions? No, OK. Um, so where were we? Right, so we were at this slide. So we're saying, okay, that's, that's basically how you could see the world. However, this is kind of unreadable yeah? because you have these small E's and it's, I mean, who, who is going to read this stuff? Yeah? So what we will do in the following is a little variation. Yeah? Basically, what this slide is saying is I take the same definition uh, as above with a slight change. So that's basically this tuple idea. Yes, just citing from what I, uh, what I had in the previous slide, yeah, having the super idea. Um, and we, we still will be doing that in our heads, but to make life much easier, uh, we will say, see, um, say, okay, I mean, assume all of these entity types have a key attribute ID yeah, for simplicity for the moment. Yeah? Each of these entity types, uh, the key is this ID attribute. Then we won't be considering this capital E as a domain, but will directly link to this key of E dot I, namely ID, E capital E I dot ID. So that's the only change I'm doing, and you will see what happens in the example, uh, then this should become clear. Now, here in this tuple representation, I'm not writing in a small E, I, subscript, superscript, whatever, but I'm referring to a specific attribute value of that key in the ID attribute of capital E. Yeah, that is a link I'm making here. So this relationship, this one here, makes links to those entities of those other entity types. And it's crystal clear what's meant and what is linked because I know in all of those um, EIs, um, capital E's, yeah, I said, yeah, the key of the, the key attribute is ID. That is unique, so if I specify anything here, it's, it's determined which entity I'm referring to in that entity type EI. Yeah, do you see that? Very important. Yeah? It's, the key concept makes it uh, crystal clear, there's no ambiguity anymore. It's, it's the entity in entity type 2 having uh, 8 as its ID. That is meant here. Yeah? And by that, you link the different entity types, uh, sorry, the different entities together uh, by writing it in, the, in this kind of tuple uh, representation. Yeah, is that kind of. Yeah, I would like to see more nodding. Or should I say, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah very good. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's how we link elements. Yeah? Okay, then that's once more us, right? <clears throat> okay, and then uh, we get to another important um, concept that is called functionally determined. So what I will be introducing in the moment is something. Uh, another annotation I write at these edges. So the uh, annotation we will be talking about now is a one. And what that means is, um, maybe I ignore this uh, um, thing for the moment. Let's start from the bottom. Uh, so what this means is, when I have an entity uh, from entity type E1, a concrete entity uh, from E1 and E2 and whatever, 
except EI. I don't have an entity there, but from all the other participating entity types in that relationship. So everything from E1 to EN except E. I, yeah, you see that, this EI is missing. So if I take a look at concrete entities from those entity types, I know which entity in EI I'm talking about. Yeah, so it's functionally determined. There's no ambiguity anymore. Just by looking at all these entities from those entity types and those, I know which entity in EI is meant. And so um, that's what we call um, functionally determined. Maybe it, maybe it makes sense here to look at the definition a little bit. So we have a relationship type, again expressed as um, a yeah, subset of the Cartesian products of those participating uh, entity types. We have a one, yeah? so here's this notation one at entity type capital E1. Then it holds that for each pair of relationships, um, so basically any tuple with these small e1s to en, um, if you have one of those tuples, b1, and the second one, then it must hold if all of those attribute values, oh, small, uh, small e, it's all, all those entities are equal. So ek equals ek prime. And you do that for everything except where k, equal, um, k equals i. Yeah? So you just make the comparison uh, for these, uh, um, you compare e1, a small e1 with e1, so this one, eh? you compare this one with this one and so forth and so forth, except you don't do the comparison of um, ei to ei prime. Yeah? And if they are all equal, that implies that the entity is the same. Yeah? So that the entity in ei uh, is the same as EI prime. So it's functionally determined. Yeah, and that is what this one is saying. And we will see uh, how important that becomes uh, in the following. And do I have some examples? Oh, which example should I show? Um, yeah, we'll, uh, let me see whether I skip here. And yeah, maybe we, we, we start with that slide. Maybe that's easier for you to comprehend. So that's an example, and I want you to focus on, um, on this part here. So here, this one, okay? So we have directors, the directors, and they have villas or mansions, if you want, uh, in English, and there's a one denoted here. And that means that if you look at a specific entity here, yeah? Quentin Tarantino, for instance, you know which villa he lives in. Yeah? So the villa is functionally determined by directors. So that's a weird way of reading if you think about it. So I'm not, uh, this doesn't say so much about this one. This says something about, so you basically read it across the relationship type. You read it from directors live in um, villas. So basically, uh, the one tells me director determines, because here's a one, villas. Villas, on the other hand, does not determine directors, which means, and that's basically also spelled out here, yes, if you have an entity of villas, I don't know which director lives there. So in theory, a villa can be shared by multiple directors. However, a director mustn't live in multiple villas. Yeah, that is what this modeling implies. Yeah, so if Canton Tarantino buys a second villa, I couldn't model that anymore because my data model says, no, no, uh, yeah, that, that's functionally determined. There can be only one villa associated with that director. So that is what functionally determined means. Yeah? And you see it in this example. So you have these kind of relationships. This is what we call a one to n relationship, yeah? one to n. There's also a one-to-one -one relationship that's possible. So here, maybe let's look at that one. That's the next slide. So a director owns a yacht, which means if you have an entity, if you have Quentin Tarantino, you know which yacht he owns. Okay? This doesn't even imply that uh, Quentin Tarantino owns a yacht. 
Yeah, this just implies that at most he owns one yacht. So this one must always be read as a maximum. Yeah? So it's either, either uh, zero or one. Yeah? So director implies the yacht, and the yacht implies actually the director. So now if I read from yachts, yachts is, uh, functionally determines directors, which means uh, um, the yacht can't be shared by multiple directors. Yeah, that's the way of reading those um, functionalities. Okay, a couple of interesting remarks uh, from the questions she had just, just in the break. Um, so these relationship types, uh, I really like, they, they express something semantically. Yeah? And one thing uh, you might uh, actually do is, uh, you would say, okay, if the director owns a yacht, uh, and owns uh, villas as well. Maybe you could also make that a ternary kind of relationship type. I highly de recommend that. Uh, we would rather use generalization for that. We will get to that in a moment when we uh, turn towards object orienting, object uh, oriented uh, modeling. Um, and the other thing is always be careful uh, with what is expressed. So here it's own and here it's live in. Yeah, to live in, you don't have to own it. Yeah? It can be a landlord, belongs to someone else, a property and stuff like that. There was one comment. And the other comment, um, I think was, here's a typo, by the way, I will fix that. So this should be E3, yeah? E1, E1, E2, E3, uh, E4 in this example. Uh, what was the other comment? Ah, yeah, yeah the keys, yeah? So uh, the one comment was, hey, I have an ID one referring an entity from capital E1, and again, there's the ID one referring an entity from E3. So shouldn't those be disjoint, yes? And, yeah? Yeah, very good. You could argue it's symbols representing the members of those domains. Yeah, that's right. Uh, another way of phrasing that is uh, each entity type has a different namespace. Yeah, so if you have an ID, uh, so in each box you can uh, use whatever you deem useful as keys, in this case for attribute ID. Uh, you can um, use any, any kind of integers and they have nothing to do with any other entity type. That's very important. Yeah? So there's no conflict. There's no global notion of an ID. Yeah, the notion of those attribute values is only with respect uh, to that specific entity type, and that is why you can reference the stuff like that easily here. Yeah? Okay, there was that comment. Okay, so we were at uh, th this slide here, uh, showing you, oops, uh, sometimes it doesn't move. So showing one-to-n -one relationships um, and one-to-one -one relationships. Now let's get back a little bit uh, at this general case, if you have a diagram like that, um, so the notation you will be seeing are these weird letters, yeah? N and M being used, or any other letter, P, Q, R. You shouldn't interpret them as variables. You could also say it's, it's just a placeholder for a star or for multiple, yeah? or saying there's no, it's not functionally determined. That's a notation originally introduced in the 70s by Peter Chen, and we will be using that. So the N, whether it's N or M, doesn't carry any meaning. The convention is just, if you have a relationship type, like half in this example, all those letters being used to annotate those, annotate those edges should be pairwise different. That's the only uh, thing I'm saying, and we wrote it down somewhere. Um, what is that? I think it's here in this, um, yeah, in this the more formal definition, we wrote it down, yeah, as you say, basically, those are just, that, that's a weird notation they introduced back then, and I still uh, think it makes a lot of sense. So basically, those annotations, that's what you see here in the definition, can be any capital letter, and that's fine, yeah? Okay. Um, yeah, that's where we originally started. So we have this one, meaning that is functionally determined. Um, and um, now if you look at what concrete examples of relationship types and um, uh, um, relationships, what that means, um, you can argue whether certain, certain um, 
certain tuples violate such a property or not. So let's um, look at that uh, um, using this example. So I have a for every relationship type yeah, from E1 to E4 having five relationships, five tuples each, B has no attributes of its own for simplicity. Yeah, and now I can, uh, let's assume that there's a one annotated at e entity type three in the corresponding entity relationship model. So E3 is functionally determined according to the entity relationship model. However, the data contradicts that because those tuples are problems. So there's one entry uh, where all the attribute values of all entity types except three are equal. Yeah? One, eight, and nine are equal. However, here we have two different entries. That is violating functionally determinedness. Yeah? That mustn't be allowed. Yeah? And later on we will uh, look at uh, how we guarantee such a property. In contrast, on the, on the right hand here, this example, let's assume there's a one annotated uh, at entity type two, so E2 should be functionally determined, then um, this is not a problem anymore. So it's the same data, but we would have to read it like those and those, those and those. So here's the difference already, so no problem whatsoever. Yeah? So the data doesn't contradict this. And maybe that brings me back to another question one of you had. Uh, he said, okay, yeah, we do all of these modeling, but what does it mean for the real system? Um, and how do we make this work? How do we implement that? So it's a little bit like in programming languages. If you have a programming language like whatever, C++, Java, you name it, eventually you wanna execute code. You wanna do binary code. And there are a couple of translation steps you will be doing when implementing a compiler. In, in programming too, you learn about that, all these different uh, translation steps through LLVM or whatever you will be using. And it's the same here. So this is a language. Entity relationship is a language we will be translating to another language, we will be translating to another language. Yeah? And then the system, so, so we're talking about language one, translated to being language two, translated to being to, to language three, and then there's a system that directly understands language three, which will translate it to language five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, whatever. Yeah? But we don't have to care about that anymore. Yeah? It's just those initial three languages we, we, are, we have to understand and everything will be fine. You don't have to worry anymore. And that's the cool thing about that. So we see how that works uh, uh, in the coming weeks. Okay. Um, yeah, so these functionalities um, are also called the Chen notation. Um, as I said, um, yeah, the caution has to be taken because um, since the 17th, since that initial proposal, many other notations were proposed. In an early iteration of this lecture, we also used a second notation that's called the min-max notation. And it can be really confusing if you use both of them at the same time because they are read the other way around. If you're interested in that, I did a video on that a long time ago where I explained the differences. Um, but you don't have to learn this stuff. So we only do chain notation and no other notation. But please also for the exercises, don't use other notation. Uh, just use this notation because it can be really confusing um, if you use, use other notation um, conventions. Yeah, so it's basically uh, also said that. Yeah? So if, if it's not determined in an ER diagram, you just write some letter N or M Yes, you, meaning you don't know, it's not, functionally, so it's not functionally determined or you don't know. And the one means, yeah, you're sure, it's functionally determined. And we annotate that because it will make a difference when translating it to the other languages. It will have an impact on how this stuff gets implemented. It will have an impact even on efficiency eventually, just by annotating a one or one of those letters. Yeah, those letters uh, or these constraints or whether it's functionally determined or not, I will be calling those things functionalities in the following. Okay, so here again, that's the schema we had. We have N and M all over the place, meaning there's nothing functionally determined really. There's not a single one here. Okay, and the, the, the change, the final change we have to do to, to convert that into an entity relationship di diagram is I will get 
I will get rid of those arrows on the next slides. Huh? On the next slide. So here you see it's just an edge without an arrow. And by doing that, now we are looking at a correct entity relationship diagram. Yeah? And that is the language we will be using directly without reverse engineering other stuff. So it's just a collection of those boxes, uh, diamonds, edges, attributes, and uh, key attributes. That's, that's all you have to know about entity relationship modeling. Okay, so we looked at that one. Yeah, as promised, um, what, what also makes a lot of sense in those diagrams is generalization. You should know that from object-oriented modeling. So, um, I mean, the difference being we don't have polymorphism in the sense that you have a, a method you call, and then in that uh, object hierarchy, in that class hierarchy, you might be calling a different method. Uh, so there are no methods attached to these entity types here. Uh, it's just about the data, not the, their behavior. And what we're doing here is we're saying, okay, well, we have different, we have persons in different roles, yeah? So why not have um, one entity type persons where we model um, first name, last name, gender, if you want to model that kind of information. And then we say, okay, actors are persons. Directors are persons. Maybe uh, people visiting movies, if you want to model that, are persons. Maybe managers are persons, yeah? and so forth and so forth. So if you, only, if you try to um, abstract that into a super class, and you can even later on decide to make that abstract, have an abstract base class, like an object-oriented modeling. Yeah? But it makes the diagram much more readable. Yeah? You don't replicate, if you go back to what we had before, uh, where was it? Uh, here was it. Yeah? Yeah, so you see it typically here we have first name, last name, no gender. Here we have first name, last name, and gender. And then what you typically see in the real world is um, yeah, maybe one entity type says name underscore first, and the other says first name, and then, the other, then there's a third entity type see, uh, saying F name, and the other name F, and whatever, whatever. Yeah, but semantically, it's the same idea. Yeah, so that's always a good idea to generalize those things into uh, yeah, a common parent uh, uh, class. Generalization. Okay. Um, so, so that's all I introduced. Yeah? So those are our modeling elements. Those are the words in that language. Yeah? So that is one word that's an entity type, relationship type. Those functionalities, N or M, of course, if you have a a ternary type, maybe you have N, M, P, or whatever, it doesn't matter, just pairwise different. Attribute, no underlining. Key attribute, underlining, and inheritance, um, R. Yeah? So you will also see is A, yeah? so that people write uh, is A in this inheritance symbol. However, we use R in this lecture because it conforms with the idea that entity types have a plural name. Actors are persons. They don't say uh, actors is a persons. That's weird. Yeah? So that's why we say are. Okay. Oh, time wise, I'm doing pretty good actually. Yeah, so then you can make that a formal definition. Yeah, so you have a quintuple. Consistently, you can read that, or you can forget about this. This, this value has uh, this, this slide has no added value whatsoever, to be honest. Yeah, but so wanted, we wanted to have a, a formal um, definition. Yeah, so those are the five. Uh, let's let, let, let's suffer through that slide, whatever. So there's a set of entity types. There, there's uh, relationship types, a set of inheritances, attributes, and uh, relationship types and the functionalities. Yeah? That's basically you could say, yeah, that's my quintuple. Looks cool, super formal, whatever. Um, I will remove that slide. <laughs> okay, so now we, we learned about that um, entity relationship modeling, Lang language number one. Now we will learn about language number two. We first learn about language number two, and then I uh, will explain to you how to translate from language one to language two, from entity relationship modeling to the relational model. Okay, that's where we are in the lecture currently. So what is a relational model? That's another super, super simple thing invented in the 70s. And if you look at that in retrospect, you know, 
I mean, why would anyone do it differently than that? Yeah, that, that's one of the things when you look, when you see it. I mean, why? why? Yeah, there's, yeah there are, it's obvious you do it like this. But in fact, people in the 60s also managed data and they used very wild ideas to manage data. And it was, was really a problem and uh, hard to maintain, had severe software engineering issues. And, and they, they knew they had to change something. And then some guys said, hey, why not do it like that? It's so much easier. And that, that was the relational model. Huh? It's really simple, but at the same time, extremely powerful. Huh? So, I mean, the world is run on Excel, let's be honest. Yeah? Most of the world's data sits in Excel uh, um, files. Yeah? But uh, on the second place, there comes the relational model. Yeah? And we'll see uh, why that is the case. Um, Excel is just a variant of relational, yeah, whatever. Um, anyway, so basically, uh, so a relation or um, a relation uh, and an unnamed relational schema and an instance. Those three things I will be explaining in this box. So relation um, is basically this tuple consisting of a schema, a relational schema, an unnamed relational schema um, and an instance. So what does it mean? Um, so basically um, I have a schema defined without using attribute names. Yeah, in the, uh, in the um, entity relationship model, we had the attribute names. Here the relational model says, well, I don't care. I just throw these attribute names away. Very weird, right? So uh, I throw these attribute names away. Um, so when the entity relationship model just looked at attribute names without domains, now we are only looking at domains without attribute names. In the 70s, they did really weird things. Don't ask me why. Yeah? But that's how they did it initially. So basically, what you, what you can do is something like that. You have all these domains from D1 to Dn, integer, cross product, string, cross product, whatever, whatever. And that is um, your schema, your relational schema without any attribute names. That's one thing. And then you have the instance. Yeah? Instance means that's a concrete subset from that cross product. Yeah, that's what you write out here. So I take any subset from that, can be empty, can be all of it, or anything uh, in the middle um, of that Cartesian product. Or cross, Cartesian product and cross product is the same in our world. I know that in the math uh, people make differences for good reasons, but here it's the same. Uh, so we take a subset over, those, um, uh, over that Cartesian product. And we call that the instance. So a con concrete uh, uh, set of those um, elements. Yeah, then we have tuple and attribute values. So we say each element T uh, in that instance uh, is called a tuple. And the individual values of A, the uh, small AI are called, um, so we have AI in the lecture, AI are called attribute values. Okay. Um, and if, uh, so we, you will see that in textbooks and um, yeah, in literature, some, uh, and it's clear that we have to do it better, that we have to introduce um, attribute names. And that's why we are extending that to use a named relational schema. In the following, I will only say relational schema, and I always mean named relational schema. Yeah, I'm lazy when spelling out these names, so relational schema is named relational schema because anything else is not readable. Huh? So this defines a schema along its domains, but not a, um, so, so what, what you looked at before, huh? that defines the schema only along its domains, but not along the attribute names. And that's what we're gonna fix with this slide. So we uh, specify domains and attribute names for each relation. Yeah? So that, is, um, that means we specify, um, yeah, it's the same thing, said twice, kind of, whatever. So here's an example. Yeah, so um, the definition of a relation looks as follows. Uh, so this notation is the same as used in this German uh, database book by Kemper and Eichler. Yeah, as I said, if you want to look up stuff, so originally this lecture was in German, so we uh, used the Kemper notation, uh, can be debated, but uh, to make it for you easier to look up things in that book, yeah, we use the same notation, so it will, make, uh, it will be very easy to look up things. Other books use other notations. There's this Navata book in English, for instance, I can highly recommend. Um, but this is a Kemper notation, yeah, saying this relation with the name R is defined as follows. So there's an attribute 
called attribute name uh, A1, and that maps to domain D1. And then there's a list of those attribute name value uh, name domain pairs. Um, yeah, here's an example. So relation movies is defined as uh, follows. So we have a attribute named ID of type or domain integer, name of type watcher, year of type int, and so forth and so forth. And this ID attribute is actually the key. And here in actors, the ID attribute is the key. Yeah? That's, that's, yeah, that's really, really easy. So it's very similar to what you see in, uh, in e relationship modeling anyway. Important is the order of attributes and tuples doesn't matter. Doesn't matter at all. Yes? So when, um, when you think about this instance definition, yeah? so this, um, oops. So an instance is always a set of tuples, and the set has no order and no duplicates. That's very important in the following. You can't insert a duplicate, and there's no order whatsoever. So the notion, uh, so saying I am interested in the tuple that comes after that other tuple, or before that other tuple, doesn't make any sense. There's no notion of before and after. It's a set without any order and without duplicates. That's very important in the relational model. Uh, come on. So, um, and the same holds for the order in how you define those attribute um, name domain pairs. It doesn't matter. It doesn't carry a, any information. If you say the ID comes first and then comes the name and whatever, it doesn't matter. Yeah, there's a convention that you typically first specify the key because then it gets a bit easier to, to read the, uh, those definitions, but you don't have to. The second attribute could be the key. The first could be whatever year or whatever you want. Uh, it's just a convention, but the order uh, doesn't matter because in the end, you refer to those attributes later on, not by their position. Yeah? If you interpreted that as, as an array, that's position zero, one, two, or three, but you only refer to it by the, by the attribute name. Yeah? So that's important. So these things, order of attributes and tuples, it's not information bearing whatsoever. And if you run into a system where it is information bearing, so you can always abuse those systems. You will, you will see anything imaginable and unimaginable in real database systems. Yeah? Uh, I've been doing that for, I don't know, 20, 20, 21 years now in databases, and I'm still shocked to see things, uh, how people use um, database thing, it's insane how people use that. Yeah? So you will be seeing uh, things like, yeah, yeah, I select the tuple and then I select the tuple after that tuple. Yeah? If you see these things, you know those people are in trouble. Yeah? Don't do that. Yeah? So it, it's not information bearing. And if you see a system that does it, please fix it. Okay, and now comes this part where we have language one and its relationship model and the relationship model is language two. And now is a translation step. So we did our diagram. And the cool thing about diagrams is, um, yeah, why are we doing it anyway? Maybe you explain me. Why should I explain it? Why, why are we doing it like that? I mean, you could directly write down the relational model anyway, right? Why not write the, this relational schema down like that for any problem we are looking at? Why do I use different languages anyway? What could be a benefit? What could be a problem of that? Yeah, someone else? I'm seeing you. Why do we do entity relationship modeling? Okay, it's in the module handbook, yeah. I have full access to the module handbook, yeah. Well, I actually wanted to, so I wanted to try out whether I can insert anything into the module handbook. <laughs> but it's there for a very good reason. Yeah, all of this stuff we have in the lectures really, so in, in, uh, 10 years ago we had still weird material in the lecture where I felt like, hey, no one ever needs that, but, but like, like 95% of the stuff you will be learning, that stuff, it's so important. You will see it later on, don't worry. So why am I teaching entity relationship modeling? Any ideas? Why does it make sense to have an extra language? We, do, we could directly start with the second language, this relational um, model. Yeah? It's like asking uh, why would you have something above machine code? If yeah. It's that, just more human readable. Yes, readable. exactly. Excellent answer. So it's like asking why do we have something above, above machine code? I mean, I would argue that relational model is a bit more readable than machine code. 
Yeah, but, but the analogy is absolutely right. So the energy relationship model is way more readable. Uh, there was some other hand, or? Yeah? I want to say the same thing. Okay, cool. Yeah, and uh, the problem is, so the examples, uh, that becomes clearer if you look at, um, I don't know. Um, if you look at an example like that, this is a textbook lecture, big data engineering lecture, any other database lecture, toy example. Real systems, hundreds of entity types and relationship types, hard to comprehend what, what is linked to what and stuff like that. Yeah? So it really makes a huge difference in, in particular uh, then if you start printing it out, not, uh, not only use a large screen, but really print it out, like uh, put it on the wall and, uh, and go through that. So the idea in software engineering or uh, engineering and database system is really you, you work on that for a very long time. Yeah, it's not just an exercise that's nasty and you do it because uh, Professor Dietrich told you you better do it. It's, it's really like you work on that, think about that, discuss it with peers. And the cool thing is you could actually teach uh, customers, depending on the customer, but certain customers could be taught to, hey, is that what you mean? Is that the data you want to represent eventually? Did I understand that collect correctly? And to get feedback from your customers. So you could ask your customer, are you interested in, in gender? Should I model that? And maybe the customer says, no, why would I in be interested in that? I, I really don't care. Yes, you drop the attribute. Or you have whatever, um, maybe for some weird reason, you're only interested in actors and not directors. Yeah? And then you ask, hey, should we really represent directors? Is that is there information you want? To no, why, why would I care about those directors? I just care about the actors. Yeah, maybe, uh, for instance, an agency um, that wants to, um, yeah, that wants to, um, yeah, that's managing actors. Huh? Assume uh, an actor uh, managing agency that uh, tr tries to find a job for actors. Huh? You could find arguments to not represent directors in that scenario. Yeah? So this is much more accessible, much more readable than just having a list of um, this weird uh, relational model. Here we are, relational model definitions. Yeah? And that's why we're doing it. Same reason as with high-level programming language versus um, yeah, whatever comes underneath machine code, LLVM, whatever. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, where am I? Yeah, now we're translating uh, in between those languages, and that's for entity relationship types easy. For uh, relationship types, mm, it depends. Yeah. So, this is uh, looks like a lot of Greek letters, but it's actually super easy. So assume we have an entity type with those attributes, yeah? some capital E1. We have a key set, so any subset of um, E1's attributes um, was identified as a key in the entity relationship model. And there's a complement set, of course, like all the attributes that are not part of the key, we, we will be calling the non-key set uh, of uh, capital E1. And then basically, well, how do you define um, this in the relational model, you say, okay, that's a name. Then we have this notation again we used above. And then basically um, you say, okay, there's a, mm, there's a set of key attributes and there's a set of non-key attributes. And this notation is, uh, I'm, I'm using, um, it's basically like list comprehensions in Python. If you ever seen that uh, notation, what I'm trying to say here is I'm unrolling the set. I'm not putting the set uh, here as an, um, as an attribute, um, but I'm saying, no, no, here, no, if you have three attributes in this set, so three key attributes, you will have three attributes in your definition of that relation. Yeah? And the same here, um, you will have as many attribute definitions as you have attributes in that non-key set. So for example, for type actors, if you look here for a moment, yeah, there's one attribute that is a key attribute that's in the key set, and there are three attributes that are, um, these three, that are in the non-key set. Yeah? And that's why I'm saying I'm basically unnesting yeah, those elements into that definition. That's it. That's all you have to do. It's a one-to-one -one translation for entity sets, um, entity types to those um, relations. Okay, so that's easy. Um, 
But what happens with uh, relationship types? Well, um, again, let's assume we have a relationship type uh, uh, coined B, capital B. It is an n-ary type, so it has n participating entity types from E1 to uh, capital E1 to capital EN, as well as uh, KB attributes of its own. Yeah? So then that can be translated in very general terms as follows. So this is, um, I say general terms because you have to think, uh, once we did that, we have to think about it again. But the first thing you do is this. So basically, um, as shown in the example above, you take all the, uh, the keys from that participating entity type E1 and unroll those yeah, as before. Yeah? The, same he, the same you do for all participating entity types. And then you again unroll um, the attributes of B. So for instance, if you um, do it for something like have, so movies have actors, so, th so this would be um, basically the, the attribute generated by this expression. This would be the attribute generated by n equals two by this expression. And uh, this corresponds to this one. Yeah? And all of these entries here together build the key of that relation. Yeah? That's what's happening here. Okay. Um, and now um, the second step, so it's a, it's a relatively easy translation a step saying, okay, whatever you reference as entity types, that's all part of the key. Yeah? And those are the attributes I'm, I'm having, uh, the, the attributes of B that, that I add to that relation definition. However, now it depends on the semantics what actually the key is. It now depends on the functionalities you're seeing in the entity relationship model. For instance, and we, we ran into that before, so movies have actors. If you modeled it like that, this would be incorrect because that implies that any combination of movie and actors can only appear once in this relation. Yeah, if you have movie 13 and actor 42, that can only appear once. If in movie 13, actor 42 has multiple roles, there's no way to model that because role is not part of the key. Yeah? So if you want to allow for actors having multiple roles in the same movie, then you have to do something like this. Then you have to make role part of the key. Yeah? A prominent example is um, Peter Sellers in uh, Dr. Strangelove, or how I learned to uh, love the bomb. Um, yeah, it's more important than ever that movie. Uh, take a look. If you have, who has seen that movie, Dr. Strangelove? Show of hands. Come on. I'm getting old. Oh my gosh. Dr. Str Peter Sellers, Dr. Strangelove, Stanley Kubrick. Go watch it. It's really cool. It's about uh, the Cold War and uh, nuclear, nuclear threats between the nations was way different. I mean, it's yeah, current affairs, you know it, yeah? but it's really cool, super funny, and there's many, many roads, um, many, many roads in that uh, movie. Yeah? And so, which means you have to do this. Yeah? So you have to do this kind of modeling. Yeah, uh, formal stuff. We skip over that. Um, yeah, movies of actors. Yeah, and uh, to to simplify this notation, we will be doing another thing, and that's this one. Um, that is a foreign key notation. Yeah? So maybe if we um, well, do that, foreign keys. Now I already introduced it here. You see it here in this example. It's formally introduced again uh, afterwards. So basically what I'm saying here is, so this is the attribute name, and I don't write a domain in the sense of integer there anymore, but I write the um, relation I'm referring to. Yeah? So this, this means, okay, movie ID, refers to movies and its attribute ID. Yeah, that makes it much more readable. If you just wrote integer, you still, okay, what is meant? What is being referred? Then typically the reference is inc encoded in the name of the attribute, yeah? So by looking at the name, you might, yeah, yeah, probably he means the movies relation. Yeah, but, but that's not always, uh, that, that may be ambiguous. So here, this makes it crystal clear. Oh, that's a reference to movies and to ID. And that is what we call a foreign key. Fremdschlüssel in German, a foreign key. So this one here is a foreign key to the key ID. 
And this one is a foreign key to the key ID here. Yeah? Okay, and that's a formal definition. Um, yeah, just in terms of notation, uh, we will shorten that a little bit because there is re redundancy. As I told you, there should be a key definition for each of those relations. So why would I repeat the, that definition here? I mean, it's clear anyway. If you look at the movies relation, you will see yeah, the, the key is ID. So why would I repeat it? So the convention, convention we will be using, and systems do the same thing, is actually that you don't spell the key out again. You just say the relation you're referencing. And that means you're referencing the key attributes of relation ID. That works if that relation only has one attribute as its key attributes. If it's multiple, you have to do this stuff here. Yeah? If it's a composed key, multiple attributes, yeah, then you have to have a one-to-one -one mapping uh, of those attributes. But very often you will see, yeah, you have something like an ID attribute and, and everything is fine. Okay, so that's just for notation to make things more readable. Yeah, um, I think we can still do that, yeah. Yeah, and then there's a simplified translation um, that you can use if a one, if, if in binary relationship types there's a one annotated, like explained above, so there's a, a, a here direct this is fun, the functional determines villas, then you can do something easier. So in this situation, you don't have to create a separate relation for live-in. Yeah, you can directly change the director's relation to refer to villas. Yeah, you know a director may have at most one villa associated to him or her. Yeah, so you don't have to create a separate relation for live-in in this situation. Yeah, so that's something I, I highly recommend you to do. Even the attributes of that relationship type can then become part of directors. Yeah? So the pseudonym, pseu, pseudonym, pseudonym, anyone is English native and can pronounce that direct, correctly? Pseudonym, psy, psy, whatever, whatever you, huh? pseudonym. pseudonym, okay. So that, that becomes an attribute of directors. Yeah? That's what we're seeing here. Yeah? So like that you avoid creating a, a separate relation for living. Yeah? And the same holds, of course, as well for these one-to-one -one relationships. Here you have, um, here you can choose. Uh, here you could say, okay, I make this um, link part of uh, directors. That's one option. You say you add a reference to the yacht in directors or in yacht you uh, add a reference to the director. Okay? And uh, keep in mind that this one, I said it before multiple times, but, but, but it recurs uh, typically in, in uh, every lecture over and over again. This one does not imply that there has to be a yacht associated. It's maximum, at most. Yeah? This, this just means director may have at most one yacht. A yacht may be associated to at mo or may be uh, owned by at most one director. It doesn't mean that the yacht is owned by a director. Can be zero directors associated to it, and the other way around also holds. Yeah? So it's just, there can be one, but it doesn't have to be one. Yeah, that's simplified. Um, yeah, there's a, a notebook on that. Uh, maybe we look at that next time. Um, that explains the relational model. I will use that next time to recap what we learned uh, today, but you can, you're invited to look at that. It's available on GitHub and walks you a little bit through a simple relation uh, definition that you can use in notebooks very easily. Um, but it's important to wrap up what we learned today, are those uh, two slides. So um, this thing I promised, uh, the, the fourth part of the structure we use for the lecture, so I, I used already various examples uh, on IMDB above throughout the lecture, so we basically did that. Question one we had, how is the data on films, actors, directors, etc., modeled and stored in IMDb? We use that through modeling this stuff in entity relationship models and the relational model, uh, translating this one to the latter. Data storage, I didn't talk about that at all. So do I put it on an SSD? Do I put it on a hard disk in my memory? The answer is I totally do not care. It really makes no 
doesn't matter at, at, at any, it's a different dimension. I will add that dim dimension eventually, but for the moment we are completely abstracting over the, over the hardware underneath. And the cool part about that is that the translation to data storage will be done automatically later on. The, the, the systems we are using will do that for us. We don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about whether you use a binary search tree, whether you use a file and binary representation or textual representation. We don't care about that. Yeah? So that will, will all be automatic. And this is called physical data independence, which means the stuff we are talking about completely ignores how data is represented physically in a machine, in memory, or whatever, because we don't need it. Yeah? We can separate that uh, concern. Yeah, and this question too, so uh, how do we model these links between data um, uh, items? That is through foreign key relationships in the relational model, yeah? referencing whatever the ID column of another entity type and so forth and so forth. And data storage, again, is the same thing. We don't have to worry about files and how that is represented anyhow. Okay, so um, if you want, there's a ton of videos I did many years ago, but they're still quite popular. Um, they explain all of these concepts using other examples, using other analogies in, in short videos. You're invited to look at that. Uh, it's in German. So uh, for English, there are also a couple of uh, videos um, on YouTube. You will find them. But if you can understand German, you can do that. This lecture from last year is also available on YouTube in German. If you're interested, 90% uh, the same thing. So with that, see you next week. Thanks. <clears throat>